In this video, I'm presenting an innovative concept of sleeping car interior with space saving single berth compartments, here and after called micro compartments. As a relevant state of the art, seven types of rail car interior should be mentioned. The simplest one is the open coach, which isn't divided into compartments. An open coach offers the highest passenger density of about 80 seats and nevertheless an acceptable level of comfort for daytime travel. But overnight journeys in an open coach are very inconvenient and passengers have no privacy. Traditional long distance train coaches are divided into compartments of six seats. Such compartments offer a high level of comfort during the day, but the passenger density is reduced to 66 seats per car. Also in a six seat compartment you can't sleep in a horizontal position and you have to share with strangers, unless you are a large family or you have the luck of a poorly occupied train. The most space-saving type of rail cars designed specially for overnight trains is the six-berth cushat car, here in an overnight configuration at the right and in daytime configuration at the left. In a cushat car you can sleep in a lying position and you can travel comfortable during the day as well. The passenger density is just about 54 to 60 berths per rail car, depending on the number of lavatories and the conductor's compartment. From the point of view of privacy, the 6 berth cushet car is not better than a 6 seat compartment car. There are also cushets with 4 berth compartments in use. In such compartments, some passengers can sit in the compartment while the others are lying. Of course, only 4 passengers in a compartment is more spacious during the day too, but the whole rail car accommodates only 36 to 40 passengers. Privacy in the meaning of traveling without strangers in a compartment is possible for groups or families of 4 or if the train is not fully occupied. The next level of comfort is the three berth sleeping car compartment, offering more comfortable wider berth than the cushioned car at similar comfort for daytime travel. These compartments offer privacy from a minimum number of three passengers, but the passenger density is even a bit lower than that of a four berth cushet. The most luxurious option is the double or single sleeping car compartment with the best possible comfort for sleeping and generous spatial conditions for daytime travel. For those who travel in pairs or have the willingness to pay for the single compartment, privacy is guaranteed, but all efforts for the whole rail car are divided amongst only 11 to 24 passengers. A more recent development are capsule cushet cars that look basically like a four berth cushet compartment that has been divided by vertical and a horizontal partition into four single berth compartments. Capsule cushet compartments are the first compartments with a ceiling that is so low that passengers cannot stand upright in the compartment, similar to an automobile or a minibus. The upper compartments can be reached from the corridor only by ladder rungs arranged vertically above each other. Capsule cushet cars have the big advantage of traveling without strangers also for single passengers and offer similar sleeping comfort as a four berth cushet compartment. Anyway, their passenger density is only two thirds of that of a six berth cushet or a half of a seating car. Furthermore, in such a capsule cushet compartment there is no comfortable seating position for traveling during daytime hours. What is actually the importance of high passenger density? A large share of the total cost depends on the required number of carriages, acquisition of the rail cars, maintenance, energy consumption and so on. But also the cost of locomotive, train driver etc. can't be divided over an unrestricted number of rail cars because of limited train and platform length. Therefore, a better utilization of the individual carriages with more seats lead to lower costs per passenger and thus to better competitiveness of long distance trains against airplanes. In order to achieve a massive shift from air travel to railway, additional locomotives and rail cars must be produced and the railroad network must be improved as well. Manufacturing of rail vehicles as well as railroad construction takes a lot of time. The more passengers a rail car can accommodate, the faster the shift from plane to train can take place. Why is it important that rolling stock for overnight trains is also suitable for comfortable traveling during the daytime? I want to explain this by comparing the expenditure of time for traveling by plane and by train. Our example of an airplane passenger spends the evening before the day of travel at home and sleeps at home. The dark green bar marks the sleeping time, medium green means normally usable time. In the early morning, the air passenger goes to the airport, waits for departure, flies, picks up the luggage and goes from the airport to the real destination of travel. Red bars mark time that can't be used for other purposes than the journey itself, and yellow such time that can be used to a limited extent. The passenger arrives before noon at the final destination and uses the time according to the purpose of the journey. 
In case of an overnight train with short travel time, for example 8 hours, the passenger goes to the railway station in the evening. The ride there takes usually less time than to the airport. The passenger spends the time in the train nearly entirely asleep. The expenditure of time is significantly less than in case of traveling by plane. If that part of the travel time that exceeds the sleeping time can rather not be spent usefully. As indicated by the yellow bars, 12 hours of travel time on an overnight train mean approximately the same expenditure of time as a short-haul flight. The more usefully daytime traveling hours can be spent, for example for working on a laptop for reading or undisturbed phone calls, the longer the distance on which trains can compete with airplanes. If the night train network focuses not only on short overnight destinations as Budapest Munich, but offers direct trains over longer distances too, much more previous flight destinations can be covered by long distance trains, for example Budapest Paris. Another advantage is better utilization of rolling stock thanks to much more passenger kilometers realized with the same number of vehicles. Therefore, a universal interior for overnight and daytime travel is important for efficient operation of such long distance trains in order to use the compartment that was, for example, booked by an overnight traveler in the section Vienna Saarbrücken, also for daytime travelers in the adjacent sections Budapest Vienna and Saarbrücken Paris. My draft of railcar interior, reconciling a high passenger density with comfortable single passenger compartment, is based on the widespread UICZ railcar type as shown on the photo. These railcars are typically divided into 11 compartments with an appropriate window spacing. In order to achieve a higher number of smaller compartments, the side corridor is replaced by a central corridor, so the width of the compartments is halved. Compared to the conventional partitioning, the compartments are shifted along the railcar by a half compartment's length. So instead of one big window in the middle of the compartment, there will be two windows of the half size at the compartment's ends. Thus, the support structure and the window openings can remain unchanged, but additional roof windows would be desirable. Here you can see some of these longitudinal compartments on both sides of the rail car. This is a lone longitudinal compartment viewed from the window side. This longitudinal compartment is further divided into three subcompartments, here with open doors as a view from the central corridor. The upper one of the three subcompartments can be reached by a short ladder similar to a bunk bed or a capsule couchette compartment. This is how the three subcompartments look like viewed from outside the rail car. In the background you see the wall between the compartment and the central corridor. This image shows the night configuration of the compartments. All dimensions are in centimeters. The dimensioning of the subcompartments corresponds basically to the human body measurements of the 95th percentile of European men respectively women, depending on the more relevant sex concerning the respective dimension. An exception is the birth length that is not sufficient for 95% of the males. For them, there are separate compartments with longer births. They will be presented later. The yellow frame indicates the lowest of the three subcompartments with the head end in the right side of the image. From this perspective, only a part of the bed surface and the small window opening in the upper right is visible. The area suitable for sitting with more inner height is in the half of the compartment next to the central corridor and is invisible from this perspective because of the legroom of the subcompartment above. The red frame shows the middle subcompartment with the head end on the left side of the image. Here you can see that at the head end, the berth width stretches over the whole compartment from the outer wall to the corridor, whereas the foot end is significantly narrower and lower in order to leave more space for the adjacent compartments. The light blue frame shows the upper subcompartment with the head end again on the right side of the image. At the foot end, the bed surface is narrow in order to gain space for the head area of the subcompartment below, making it possible to sit upright on the bed surface of the middle subcompartment. Here you can see the same three subcompartments viewed from the central corridor. In the background, you see the windows. The total height corresponds to the common usable inner height of a conventional long distance rail car. The roof window might get smaller or divided because of supporting structures. The yellow solid line frame indicates the head end of the lowest compartment, visible as a whole. The foot end of the lowest compartment is located along the outer wall, indicated by a dashed line. Similarly, the head end of the middle compartment, indicated by the red solid line, is completely visible from this perspective, whilst the foot end and the upper headroom are indicated by a dashed frame and not visible from the corridor side. The bed surface of the upper compartment, indicated by a light blue frame, is completely visible. This image shows the compartments from the corridor again, but in daytime configuration. The during the night lowest compartment, here again marked with a yellow frame, and the during the night middle one, here again marked with a red frame, 
have their seats on the same level during the daytime. The backrests of the seats are facing to the transversal partitioning walls in order to make use of the maximum possible seat width next to the legroom of the adjacent compartment. The fold-up table in the middle is narrower than the seat but wide enough for a laptop or a meal. In the area of the middle partitioning, the height above the tables of both compartments is limited because of the legroom of the upper compartment, indicated by the light blue frame. The seating position of the upper compartment next to the central corridor facilitates the optimal utilization of the carrier's inner height. For the left compartment in the image, in the night configuration that's the lowest compartment, a vertical adjustable seat might be useful, allowing passengers of low height a view through the small window too. Storage space for luggage is below the seats and berths of the lower and the middle subcompartments. Additionally, a part of the space above the central corridor can be used as a luggage rack for the upper subcompartment. This horizontal section of the compartment shows the whole bed surface of the lowest compartment, indicated by the yellow frame. The part within the red frame belongs to the middle subcompartment. Here is the section plane shifted upwards, so the whole bed surface of the middle compartment is visible, indicated again by a red frame. The yellow frame indicates a part of the bed surface of the compartment below. That is now the upper bed surface with a light blue frame. The light green part in the upper right is a shelf above the headroom of the middle compartment, indicated by the red dashed frame. This image shows the dimensions of the seat area in the daytime configuration. The smaller part within the yellow frame is the seat area of the lowest compartment. The bigger part within the red frame belongs to the middle compartment. A seat area next to the corridor and the part of the bed surface that remains during the day. Tables are drawn in light green color. The grey hollows represent parts of the berth upholstery that may be used as backrests during the daytime. Anyway, an analog life-size experiment is always better than every digital 3D model. The complete construction of the whole structure with three subcompartments wouldn't be feasible for me, but two representative parts of them I could simulate. The night configuration of the lowest subcompartment and the daytime configuration of the middle subcompartment. For the simulation of the compartment's geometry, I had to use various objects available in our household during the lockdown measures against the coronavirus outbreak. Compared to a real compartment, this led to the additional challenge for the test passenger not to touch the valves too much to avoid a collapse of the fragile construction. Nevertheless, you can enjoy the coziness of the lowest top compartment in various sleeping positions. So that's how you can lie in such a micro compartment. My legs are stretched out and there is enough space around my head. There is also enough height to lie on one side. Now I show you how I can turn between different sleeping positions. Now I brief the face down position. Now I'm lying on the other side. And now on my back. In fact, I slept one night in the simulation of the compartment and I slept well. For the simulation of the daytime position, I focus on the width of the seat area between the wall, the corridor and the legroom of the adjacent compartment, as well as on the length of the seat area and the height restriction due to the legroom of the upper compartment, simulated by the red box in the upper corner. For my taste, this seat area is spacious enough for several comfy and productive hours and definitely more comfortable than a conventionally seated rail car. Furthermore, in such a micro compartment carriage, you have the possibility to lie down at any moment during daytime as well. Returning to the comparison with conventional types of rail car compartments, the micro compartment accommodates per rail car length the same number of passengers as a 6 berth couchette compartment. 6 per window exits, 50% more than a 4 berth couchette or a capsule couchette. During the day, the micro compartment offers significantly better comfort than a capsule couchette, facilitating upright seating at a table and in most cases a view through the window. During the night, the micro compartment offers similar comfort as a conventional couchette or the capsule couchette. An enormous advantage of the micro compartment car is undisturbed traveling without strangers in the compartment. In various parts of the rail car, the described micro compartment design is applied in some modifications. In the middle of the rail car, two of the described standard micro compartment sections are implemented. The penultimate compartments before the ends of the rail car are 15 cm longer than the standard compartments. At this position, such deviation between compartment length and window spacing is possible without discrepancies between windows and partitioning of the following compartments. For tall people, these compartments are better than all conventional carriages for overnight trains with a transverse berth arrangement, limiting the berth length to the carriage width minus the width of the corridor. At each side of the rail car, 
there are two emergency exit windows. Next to them, there is no middle subcompartment, making the lowest subcompartment more spacious concerning width and height. Furthermore, below the emergency exit windows, there is space for bulky luggage that cannot be accommodated within the compartments. At the carriage's end, the corridor bends from the middle to the side of the rail car, so toilets and switch cabinets can be arranged similar to a conventional rail car, respectively remain unchanged in case of reconstruction of an existing rail car. On one side of the rail car, the outermost compartments are tapered, so there is again only the upper and the lowest compartment. These compartments have also a length of 200 instead of 185 cm. On the other side, the space usable for compartments becomes wider next to the end of the rail car. A part of this space is used for a longitudinal compartment for two passengers, not divided into single passenger subcompartments. Directly next to the back wall of the toilet, there is a compartment with three berths arranged transversely to the direction of movement. These two compartments can be joined to a family compartment of five berths. In case of operation with a conductor in each rail car, the transverse compartment with three berths would be very suitable as a conductor's compartment, as it offers a view along the whole corridor. In this configuration, the micro-compartment car achieves a density of 54 passengers per rail car in case of operation without conductor, the same number of passengers as a 6 berth couchette car with conductor. If one of the three berth compartments is used for a conductor, the capacity is reduced by 6% to 51 passengers. Despite the high passenger density, less than a quarter of the total capacity are standard compartments, 30% offer longer berths, and about a third are more spacious concerning height and width. So the micro-compartment car fills the market gap for single passengers in overnight trains. But isn't there a lack of solutions for pairs and families that want to travel cheap but together too? Compartments for two passengers can be created by joining of two adjacent single berth compartments of mirrored arrangement. This would be well feasible particularly for the lowest subcompartments, here again indicated with a yellow frame. The upper compartments could be joined to a double compartment as well, as indicated here with a light blue frame if passengers accept to sit in unusual distance each to another. Of course, such a double compartment could also be booked by a single passenger, offering a berth width of more than 90 cm over the whole length of the standard compartment. In case of high occupation, the fear of such a compartment would be twice the fear of a standard compartment. In off-peak situations with lower degree of occupation, the difference of fear might be less. For larger groups and passengers with more willingness to pay, Conventional couchette and sleeping cars can be deployed additionally. For groups or families of four, a conversion of three berth sleeper compartments into four berth compartments with some kind of double bed on the lowest level would be an option, here shown in the night configuration on the right and in daytime configuration on the left. I will end here hoping that I presented my concept understandable. I would be happy if I could contribute to the development of new overnight and long distance services by this and similar ideas. At the micro-compartment railcar website, you can find a static image gallery and a page of questions and answers. For answers and suggestions, I'm available by email.